Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. World of Warbirds is normally a podcast that profiles an individual warbird, taking you, the listener, from the design to the prototype, operational history, and post-war life of the aircraft. However, from time to time, I will break up that pattern by providing an episode on either a bigger picture look at some element of World War II aviation, or diving down deeper to explain an element that might be generally taken for granted or misunderstood. An example of the latter would be looking at turbochargers. What exactly are they, and how do they affect aircraft design and performance? And what's the difference between a turbocharger and a supercharger anyway? Today, however, is an example of the former, a big picture look at the ideas behind strategic bombing. With the benefit of hindsight, it would seem that the big bombers of World War II would be inevitable. Even those with faint interest and little knowledge of history can probably conjure up the images of the Blitz in London, or of the Allied bomber boys heading off on another day or night mission over Germany and almost everyone knows about the atomic bombing of Japan, how it seems so completely natural and even preordained that these things would come to pass. But that assumption would be an error. Most people would be shocked to learn that at the dawn of aviation, many political and military leaders of the past regarded the ideas around independent air forces and strategic bombing as science fiction at best and heresy or treason at worst, but that is the greater truth. Political and military careers were broken and made on these theories. The big bombers that we will be studying in later episodes of World of Warbirds were designed and built to test and utilize these theories, and thousands would die in the air and on the ground in order to prove them one way or another. But what exactly were these bombing planes doing anyway? Why devote so much money, energy, production power, scarce materials and manpower to this? Was it just revenge bombing? Some sort of back and forth, tit for tat, you hit our city, we're hitting yours, gang war type of thing, writ very, very large? Or was there a method behind the madness? Well, there was a method, and it was called strategic bombing. So where did the idea of strategic bombing come from? Strategic bombing was basically a kind of economic warfare, which is actually a very old idea. It's true that wars mainly get decided on the battlefield by warriors facing other warriors. Leadership and training plays a role, as well as motivation, however, no matter how well trained or led, it always helps you to win if you have an enemy who hasn't been properly fed or who is running out of ammunition, be it slings and arrows or bullets and hand grenades, or who is demoralized because he's just read a letter stating that things are bad at home and could he please desert as soon as possible and get back to help save the farm. Naval blockades have done and still do this job. If you can't get your materiel from the homeland to the front, then the warriors are less effective. Or, if you can't even get the raw materials into your workshops of the homeland, then again, the war effort is hampered. Sieges of cities are basically an army's version of a blockade. Bottle up a city so that nothing can get in or out. The city can't help in the war effort, and eventually might actually be starved and demoralized into submission. Raids, either by cavalry or fast-moving infantry, think of Sherman's marches during the American Civil War, are when an armed force moves across an enemy country, not to try to hold the territory, but just to wreak economic mayhem on the opposing economy. Burning crops in the fields, destroying factories and workshops, taking livestock, disrupting farming activities, destroying railroads and bridges, all make it very difficult for a nation to continue feeding and supplying their forces in the field. None of this is new. Hannibal knew about it just as well as Napoleon. 
So when flying machines were invented, first as balloons, then as dirigibles, also known as airships, and finally heavier-than-air aircraft, some thinkers thought that they could be used in this type of role in order to help in a war effort. The extremists thought that this could be the only war effort. Some of the first views of this idea could be seen in science fiction writings before and after the First World War. Don't make fun of science fiction writers, folks. They get a lot of stuff wrong, but they also get a lot of stuff right, too. H.G. Wells' The War in the Air, published as a serial in 1907, described an aggressive Germany using fleets of airships, which were used like flying aircraft carriers, deploying smaller aircraft called Dragenfliegers, attacking an unprepared and unaware United States. They start by wiping out the American Atlantic fleet of dreadnought battleships, which are helpless against the airborne foe. The appearance of the German air fleet over New York so panics the populace that the city surrenders. Later, certain American holdouts stage an attack on the Germans, who then proceed to pound the city to dust. The story gets very apocalyptic when other nations jump into the fight, especially when a fleet of airships from the Confederation of Eastern Asia, which is Japan and China, arrive over the defeated and occupied U.S. in order to fight the Germans for the spoils. The widespread war in the air destroys city after city until the world is reduced to a walking dead without the zombies, barbaric agrarian age. What made the story so interesting was the idea that a war could be fought almost exclusively from the air. Armies and navies had been made obsolete when an enemy force controlled the air above. Of course, in 1907, this certainly was very science fiction indeed, with the emphasis on the fiction. Airships at the time were slow and lumbering and filled with explosive hydrogen, and in fact, that wasn't going to change much with time. Airplanes were flimsy, weak, and underpowered, and at the time, the idea that they would one day destroy entire cities was laughable. With the outbreak of the First World War, some of these ideas got the chance to be tried. It's not widely known, but Russia is credited for having the first heavier-than-air strategic bomber with the Sikorsky Ilya Muromets S-23. This was the first four-engine bomber in the world, and was based on an earlier airliner version, the S-128, which was actually supposed to be a fairly comfortable airliner for the time, allowing 16 passengers to sit in wicker chairs in a heated enclosed cabin with electrical lighting. There were even doors built into the sides of the fuselage for a mechanic to have access to the engines in flight. I do wonder what the passengers thought to see a mechanic go out a side door and walk across the wing to repair an engine in flight. During the war, the Germans employed bombing zeppelins in raids against England. Although initially the British had almost no defenses against what they called the baby killers, the zeppelins themselves weren't able to do much damage anyway. They didn't carry a large bomb load, and during the night raids, navigation and targeting was very difficult. During the course of the war, the British improved their defenses, and especially the introduction of the incendiary bullet made the hydrogen-filled Zepps very dangerous to operate. Germany also used airplanes to bomb England, the most famous being the Gotha. These were large, twin-engine biplanes with a crew of three, one pilot and two gunners. These aircraft had a reputation for, for being quite difficult to fly, and piloting them has been described as a wrestling match between the pilot and the aircraft. Most of them were actually lost in flying accidents than to enemy action. The Gotha's top speed was only 87 miles per hour, and on a typical raid on England, it could only carry six 110-pound bombs. Although these raids did cause some RAF fighter squadrons to be withdrawn from the front to be occupied in defense of the home island, it would seem that the main impact of the Zeppelin and Gotha raids on England was more psychological 
in that it showed that England's time of splendid isolation was now over and that the English Channel was no barrier to this type of attack. The British had their own big bomber during this time frame, the Handley Page Type O. At the time, this was the biggest aircraft in the world and had a similar configuration to the Gotha, being a twin-engine biplane with a pilot and two gunners. It seemed to also share some of the handling characteristics of the Gotha when we consider the quote by RAF pilot Cecil Lewis, who said that when, quote, you decide to turn left, you pushed over the controls, went and had a cup of tea, and came back to find the turn just starting, end of quote. The Handley Page was used in a variety of roles in Flanders, the Dardanelles being used to attack ports, railway targets, airfields, submarines, and shipping. Although the results were not overwhelming, this aircraft, and in fact all the bombers of the First World War, did seem to show what might be possible in the future. And Billy Mitchell, who we will meet later, would go on to use the Handley Page Type O to show exactly what a bombing aircraft could do to a battleship. The end of fighting in World War I was the starting line for the fight of the air services of the world for their own survival in peacetime and their search for a role. Many of their leaders did not believe that the war to end all wars would really live up to that name. As for military aviation, it all depended on how one thought about it. Were airplanes to be used only in a tactical role in order to support troops on the ground or ships at sea? If so, then they didn't need their own separate air forces. However, many of the officers who had served in aviation during the Great War had seen the promise of air power and wanted to develop it. Of course, they also wanted to keep their ranks and power and not be demoted to be subservient to armies or navies. On the other hand, Army and Navy leaders didn't really want to share the very limited peacetime budgets with the new kid on the block, and many seemed to want to smother the aviation baby in the cradle. The hell of World War I trench warfare deeply affected many military and political thinkers in the interwar period. The idea that a ground war could be completely prevented by use of aviation was very appealing. One who is always mentioned in this area and had significant influence was Italian General Giulio Duhé. He was born in 1869 and began writing about the promise of aviation in 1912 with his report Rules for the Use of Airplanes in War, Regole por uso degli aeroplani in guerra. The powers that be thought that he was an extremist, and so he was shunted into the infantry. However, this didn't stop him. When the Great War broke out, Duhay was highly, and, which was probably worse, publicly critical of Italy's ill-preparedness in terms of aviation. He wanted a fleet of at least 500 heavy bombers. However, instead he was court-martialed and sent to prison for criticizing Italy's military leaders. Prison didn't shut him up either, and like many prophets of various types throughout the years, he used his jail time to continue to write about aviation, including writing a novel. Somebody must have been reading and liking his material, for his career resurrection was fairly rapid after he got out of prison. In 1917 he was released. In 1918 he returned to service as head of the Italian Central Aeronautics Bureau, and in 1921 he was promoted to the rank of general and wrote his most influential work. The Command of the Air, Il Dominio del Aria. Douai wrote that air power would introduce the third dimension to warfare. Up until that time, armies and navies had only clashed on two dimensions. The air war opened up a third dimension that would allow a fleet of bombers to simply fly over an enemy army or navy as if it wasn't even there, instantly rendering these forces utterly impotent. These bombers wouldn't even bother to attack the enemy's army or navy, but continue on to attack the cities of the enemy's homeland, focusing on targeting industries, transport infrastructure, communications, government, and, in quotes, the will of the people, close quotes. He suggested using different types of bombs to get the best effect from the attack, 
High explosive would destroy the targets. Incendiaries would set fire to the damaged structures. And poison gas would keep firefighters and rescue crews from helping out. He thought that making the attack as terrible as possible would shatter civilian morale and break the will of the people. Once this had happened, the demoralized and terrified citizens would ask their governments to surrender. If the governments did not sue for peace, then further bombing would cause the common people to rise up against their government and overthrow it in a revolution. The new government would then sue for peace. Duhé believed that simply the idea of this horror would be enough to prevent aggression. Why would any sane government attack when it meant the destruction of not only one city's social fabric and the overthrow of its own political power? Duet saw any resources invested in anything other than a bombing force as wasteful and even dangerous. Tactical aviation in support of the army or navy was a waste, when these airplanes could be better used to attack the enemy homeland. Besides, the armies and navies were now obsolete and useless, so why have them at all? But what about air defense, you ask? In Duet's opinion, the best defense was an overwhelming offense. An attacking bomber fleet could bomb the enemy's air fleet when it was on the ground and destroy the factories, making any new ones. Besides, the sky was huge, and it would be always possible for an attacking fleet to go around or over any defenses. This particular theory was supported by the phrase, the bomber will always get through. This line was used by British statesman Stanley Baldwin in a 1932 speech. We should probably remember this line when, later on in other episodes, we are talking about the B-17s and Avril Lancaster offensives against Germany. For many people, especially those who had lived through the horrors of the trenches of the First World War, these theories were comforting. All we need is a fleet of enough of these bombers to prevent war? No one can argue against that, right? Let's see how several countries adopted these theories into air policies. But before we do that, let's take a short break. If you get some joy out of listening, please consider supporting the podcast by making a modest donation via PayPal. My PayPal address is at WOWB17. That's at World of Warbird17, or if you want to remember it this way, at WOWB17. You'll have my eternal gratitude. In the United States, one man who had read Duhé was Lieutenant Colonel Billy Mitchell. Mitchell had an interesting history. His father had actually fought in the Civil War and had served in the same regiment as General MacArthur's father. Billy had joined the Army when he was 18 and probably, with some help from his father's connections, obtained a commission in the Signal Corps. He also just happened to see the Wright brothers fly in 1908. Later, he took flying lessons for himself. At that time, military aviation was considered a part of the Signal Corps, and Mitchell was appointed head of the aviation section, U.S. Signal Corps. By 1916, he was a major and appointed chief of the air service of the First Army. During World War I, he distinguished himself as one of the top American airmen of that conflict, although it was noted that his views tended to alienate him from his superiors. Or, in other words, he was a pain in the ass. He returned from Europe convinced that the war to end all wars wouldn't actually end all war, and that future wars would be decided by air power. He thought that American air power should be concentrated in an air force, equal to the army and the navy. The powers that be disagreed with his attitude, and when Congress reorganized the army in 1920, they made the air service a branch of the army, but third in line behind the infantry and the artillery. Mitchell was disappointed, and no matter what his other achievements, he just wasn't good at making friends. In 1921, he got into a seriously nasty conflict with the Navy. It's understandable that admirals didn't like him much, as he was going around saying how that their precious Navy was obsolete, and that they shouldn't be given any more money to buy new white elephant dreadnoughts or battleships. Mitchell was saying that for the cost of one battleship, 1,000 planes could be built that would be able to wipe out any enemy ships that approached the American coastline. 
Mitchell proposed doing some tests where his airplanes would try to sink some old battleships. If he could do it, then he would prove his point. The Navy, attempting to cut him off with his own game, rushed through their own series of tests, supposedly proving that airplanes couldn't sink the battleships. Then a newspaper dug up the dirt that the Navy had actually cheated on their own test, using dummy bombs and explosive charges instead. Busted! Congress forced the Navy to submit to Mitchell's test, which became known as Project B. However, a news blockout was imposed on the test, supposedly until the results could be properly assessed. Mitchell thought that this was just a Navy ploy to try to bury the results, and he drummed up public support through the media to keep the tests public. The Navy countered with many conditions that made the tests more difficult for the air service. They demanded that the target battleships be placed 50 miles away from shore so as to not be a danger to navigation. This might have been true, but it also limited the time over the target that the airplanes of the day would have. To make matters worse, they also demanded that a team of damage assessment experts could go aboard between each bomb hit. Again, this would force the airplanes to circle around while they went aboard and did their thing. Finally, in June and July, the tests began. Mitchell's planes sank an old destroyer and an old cruiser, following the rules that were set up for the test. On July 21st, the ex-German battleship Ostfriesland, which had been surrendered to the Americans after World War I, was attacked by Mitchell's British-made Handley Page bombers. It dropped six bombs all at once beside the old battleship, and the ship rose up several feet in the air with its hull plate stove in, rolled over, and sank. The aviation supporters said, See, we sank your battleship. The Navy said, Yeah, but it wasn't really wartime conditions. Nobody was shooting back, and the ship wasn't even moving. The aviation people said, yeah, but the tests prove that we can sink your stupid battleships. And the Navy said, yeah, but you broke the rules of the test. And the aviation people said, yeah, but your rules were totally unfair and made the test even less like a true wartime situation. And the Navy people said, yeah, and we could have saved the ship if there had been a crew aboard and we could have repaired the damage. The results of the tests were highly controversial. Nobody was happy and even President Harding was upset that Mitchell had shown the world that the U.S. Navy had a major weakness. The next year, in 1922, Mitchell met Guillaume Duhay and brought back a translated copy of his book, The Command of the Air, and distributed it around the air service. In 1924, he predicted a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. He continued to push his ideas and ruffle feathers by writing a book called Winged Defense in 1925. That year he was demoted, perhaps as a punishment. That same year, after the crash of the Navy airship Shenandoah, Mitchell wrote such a scathing statement on the incompetence of the Army and the Navy leadership that President Calvin Coolidge had him court-martialed basically for conduct unbecoming a member of the U.S. military. He was found guilty and sentenced to a suspension from duty without pay for five years. He resigned instead and spent the rest of his life continuing to write and promote air power. He died in 1936 at the age of 56 of heart issues and influenza. It's too bad that Mitchell did not live to see the vindication of his ideas and the tests. In 1942, he was posthumously promoted to a two-star major general. In 1946, he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. And perhaps coolest of all, he had the B-25 medium bomber named after him. If you haven't listened to the episode on the B-25 Mitchell, give it a shot after finishing this one. In the 1930s, the U.S. was isolationist. However, this somewhat worked in favor of the idea of big bombers. What a great way to convince politicians that you need funding. No, no, we won't get involved over there, but we need fleets of long-range bombers in order to hit them if they try to come over here. American industry was also looking to build the machines that would be able to do this job. 
In 1930, Boeing, using their own funds, built their first bomber, the predecessor to the B-17 called the B-9. It was kind of weird looking. It was a twin-engine monoplane with fixed gear and has a fuselage that looks like a straight metal pipe that barely seems to have a cockpit. But it could carry 2,000 pounds of bombs at 190 miles per hour. The Martin Aircraft Company built the B-10, which could carry 2,200 pounds at over 200 miles per hour. This twin-engine bomber had retractable gear and powered gun turrets, and although slightly ungainly, is definitely recognizable as a bomber warbird. One big fan of the B-10 was General Henry Hap Arnold. He described it as the air power wonder of the day. He flew a flight of B-10s non-stop from Juneau, Alaska to Seattle, Washington to show the potential for long-range operations. In 1924, he worked closely with Mitchell and became a fan of his ideas. During the Mitchell court-martial, Arnold and his colleagues, Carl A. Spotts and Ira C. Aker, all testified on Mitchell's behalf, despite being warned that they were all jeopardizing their military careers to do so. They believed in Mitchell and testified anyway, and after Mitchell's guilty verdict, despite any setbacks garnered by their actions, they all eventually went on to lofty leadership roles in the Air Forces, bringing with them Mitchell's and Duhez's ideas. As Hap Arnold's career progressed, eventually all the way up to the command of the entire Air Force of the United States, he encouraged the development of the B-17, which he believed would be needed for any future strategic bombing campaign. In 1939, Arnold consulted with none other than the famous aviator Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh had recently toured Luftwaffe bases in Germany and brought back ominous reports of Germany's air force's advanced state and superiority to their European rivals. Following this, new requests for medium and long-range heavy bombers were made. In November 1939, specifications began to be prepared for the ultimate realization of the idea of strategic bombing during the Warbird period. This was known as the VLR, or Very Long Range Bomber. This seed was to grow into the B-29 Superfortress. In July 1941, President Roosevelt asked for plans to defeat potential enemies, and Arnold endorsed Plan AWPD-1, standing for Air War Plans Division Plan No. 1. This plan emphasized industrial web theory, to describe how strategic bombing could be used to attack vulnerable choke points in Germany's economy, including electrical power systems, transportation networks, and oil resources. It even suggested that the civil population of Germany could be targeted as a final step in order to break morale and will and to achieve capitulation. It also foresaw a later strategic air offensive against Japan prior to an eventual invasion. The stage was set for the American strategic bombing campaigns against Germany and Japan. Could air power actually win the war all by itself? Duhé thought so, and over in Britain, so did Sir Arthur Harris. He was born in Rhodesia, was an RAF pilot in the First World War, and in the interwar period stayed in the RAF, where he was able to develop his ideas of strategic and area bombing during colonial conflicts in the Middle East. He also helped to develop RAF's night training for night operations, which would become useful. Just before the war, Harris was an air commodore and pushed hard for big strategic bombers, which could bomb German targets from England. The desires for this type of aircraft resulted in specifications that led to the Avro Manchester, Handley Page Halifax, and the short Sterling. He later went on to command the entire British bombing effort, which led to Harris being nicknamed Bomber Harris. His belief that his bombers alone could bring Germany to her knees was so unshaken that he even protested strongly having his aircraft diverted from this effort in order to help out with the Normandy landings. Bomber command was initially led by Richard Pierce. Although he built up the force from the pre-war period, 
The results of Bomber Command's daylight bombing activities were disappointing, and the losses were hard to swallow. Churchill was presented with two reports. First, the Butt Report, written by David Ben Susan Butt, concluded that only one British bomber in three was getting within five miles of a target, and only 5% of bombers bombed within five miles of their target. They just couldn't seem to hit the factories. The second was Professor Frederick Lindemann's dehousing paper. He had examined the effects of the Blitz on England and concluded that it would be more effective to destroy workers' houses rather than try to hit the factories themselves. The RAF said that it could destroy the 43 German cities with a population of more than 100,000 using a force of 4,000 bombers. The chief of the air staff, Sir Charles Porter, argued that with such a force, Bomber Command could win the war in six months. Even though Churchill thought that this was overly optimistic, the RAF countered that even if the dehousing plan did not work as promised, it would weaken the enemy sufficiently to allow British armed forces to build up and eventually to return back into continental Europe. The plan was approved by Cabinet, and Sir Arthur Harris was given the job of running the British Bomber Command, a job that he kept until the end of the war. He ruthlessly pursued his goal of bringing Germany to its knees by air power alone, by switching to night attack and area bombing, by larger and larger formations of larger bombers such as the Avril Lancaster. Germany didn't start the war with big bombers, and that is partly due to a single plane crash on June 3, 1936. On board was General Walter Weaver. Weaver was appointed the Chief of Staff of the Luftwaffe just after its creation in February 1935. He was a supporter of the idea of strategic bombing and encouraged German aircraft companies to build four-engine bombers. This project was known as the Eurobomber. The idea was that in the event of a war with Russia, Weaver thought that perhaps German ground forces might be able to reach Moscow in the initial offensive. However, he worried that they might get bogged down due to the vast distances involved. He worried that the Russians might simply move their industries east of the capital city and away from the Germans, to the region of the Ural Mountains. Weaver thought that Germany should have a long-range heavy bomber fleet to hit these factories, and hence this project was known as the Ural Bomber. German industry had responded to his requests. Dornier had built a prototype called the DO-19 in 1936. It was a four-engine bomber that actually looked a little like an early B-17, but with twin tail fins. The Junkers Ju-89 was also to be a four-engine heavy bomber. It looked a bit like the cross between a B-17 and a Halifax. Two prototypes were built of each. However, on June 3, 1936, Weaver was killed in a plane crash, and without his advocacy, other leaders within Germany moved the priorities elsewhere. Erhard Milch, who was the secretary of the Reich Ministry of Aviation, was up to the task of producing big four-engine bombers in sufficient numbers. Hermann Göring, who was the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe, was also thinking about numbers when he favored putting the project on ice and was supposed to have said, quote, the Fuhrer will never ask me how big our bombers are, but how many we have. End of quote. Ernest Udet, another leader in the new Luftwaffe, placed a heavy emphasis on the tactical uses of aircraft, especially dive bombing. And this was how the Luftwaffe was eventually set up, to be more of a flying artillery for the Blitzkrieg style of war, quick, shocking victories that would end a war before enemy industry would get ramped up anyway. When the Luftwaffe did get into the business of bombing cities for its own sake, in what the Brits called the Blitz, they were unprepared for it, and although they employed the Henkel HE-111 as a stand-in strategic bomber, they just didn't have the capacity to produce the kind of body blows to the UK that the German and Japanese nations were about to receive from the Allies. When Operation Barbarossa stalled just before Moscow, just as General Walter Weaver had thought it would, 
and the Luftwaffe didn't have the capabilities for a strategic bombing offensive against Russia, I wonder if he turned in his grave. In 1942, with the entry of the United States into the war, the Reich Air Ministry embarked on a crash program called America Bomber in order to try to have the capability to attack American targets such as New York. Focke Wolf, Junkers, and Heinkel all submitted designs, and Messerschmitt actually built and test flew the ME-264, which looks remarkably like the B-29, especially from the front. Ultimately, the lack of suitable engines and the difficulties caused to the German aircraft industries by the Allies' own strategic bombing offensive forced the project to be abandoned. It is interesting that Duez's birthplace, Italy, did not truly embark on a program of strategic bombing. The Italian Air Force did have a fairly good four-engine bomber in its inventory, the Piaggio P-108. It was based on the B-17 and even looked a little like it. Italy built 163 of them, but did not use them in a concerted strategic bombing offensive. One potential reason for why the B-108 was sidelined could have been that Captain Bruno Mussolini, the son of El Duce, was killed in a crash of a P-108 on the 7th of August 1941. Piaggio's production of the bomber came to an abrupt halt on the 31st of August 1943 when an Allied strategic bombing raid destroyed the factory in Tuscany where it was built. It's interesting to know that following the war, Piaggio used this rebuilt and retooled factory to construct Vespa scooters. Even though, as we have learned earlier, Russia was the first nation to fly a heavy bomber, they started the Second World War with only one long-range, four-engine strategic bomber, the Petlakov PE-8. They built 96 of them, and they were used in a limited fashion after the outbreak of war for a few morale-raising attacks on Berlin. However, Russia understandably threw its aircraft industry wholeheartedly into producing tactical aircraft in order to support the Red Army. And although the Allies sent many aircraft, including twin-engine medium bombers, such as the B-25 Mitchell, to Russia, they did not give them strategic bombers directly. Indirectly, they provided them with the seed for Cold War strategic bombers when several B-29s made emergency landings in Russia and they were reverse-engineered to design the Tu-4, the Russian twin of the superfortress. Very much along the lines of Germany, Japan did not have a strategic bombing force at the start of the war. The Imperial Japanese Army Air Service was to provide tactical close air support and aerial reconnaissance for ground forces. For projecting power, the Japanese relied on their aircraft carriers and excellent naval aviation in order to reach out to attack their enemies. Japan did bomb cities, most notably in China, but more in a shock and awe type attack to spread terror and panic rather than a systematic program to try to destroy Chinese industry. Again, like Germany, Japan looked into a crash building program in 1942 called Project Z. This was to design a bomber capable of taking off from the Kuril Islands, hitting America, and then continuing on to land in German-occupied France. Nakajima submitted a design for the G-10N, a sleek-looking six-engine bomber that resembled somewhat the American DC-4. However, at this time, the Japanese aircraft industry was just not capable of even producing a prototype. It was too busy producing fighters for defense and desperately trying to win an aerial war of attrition. So, Due to the ideas, policies, and leadership that have been described during this episode, it was the Allies who started building heavy bombers en masse and trying to prove the theories on strategic bombing at the start of hostilities. It is for this reason that we ended up with cities being pounded to rubble, day and night, in ever-escalating force and ferocity that culminated, ultimately, in a flash of light brighter and hotter than the surface of the sun, 
over the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is why we ended up with such aircraft as the British Short Sterling, Avril Lancaster, and Hanley Page Halifax, and the American Consolidated B-24 Liberator, Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, and B-29 Super Fortress. These aircraft will all be examined in detail in later episodes of World of Warbirds. Remember that you can always check out our Facebook page in order to see the uh, pictures of what's been described in this podcast. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss anything. And you can also like that Facebook page.